Our topic this week is progressives and progressivism. And our guest, James Ostrowski, is here to explain exactly how progressives came to control the political, legal, cultural, and social landscape in America, and what we, as liberty-minded people, can do about it. Jim is an appellate lawyer, he's a writer, a very effective libertarian activist and agitator, and a longtime observer of progressives in one of their top natural habitats, namely the state of New York. Murray Rothbard called Jim one of the finest people in the libertarian movement. So if you want to understand progressives from a Rothbardian perspective, stay tuned for a great interview with Jim Ostrowski. Jim, it's interesting to me you bring up the idea of how progressives have a seductive message for people. And we know, of course, that progressives control media, education, art, literature, pop culture, music, etc. Do you agree with this perspective that progressives have done their long march through history and that they're they're really good and really patient when it comes to incrementalism? Well, I do. One of my current research interests is cultural Marxism because it seems like their points of view are, are sweeping through the country at an incredibly rapid rate. But there's no question that they control the main organs of idea dissemination either formally in the case of public schools, which are really almost an explicit for progressive institution. And then, of course, you know, the media is sort of informally progressive, and there's a lot of research that could be on that, the revolving door between the media and the government, and how the government controls the media through giving them the sources of news and so on, or punishing them if they don't report properly. Really, it, it, you know, journalism is a generally has almost become a branch of the government. I think that that's pretty obvious. So with, they unfortunately do control access to the minds that we need to reach, and there's no particularly easy answer to get around that other than what a lot of institutions are already doing, you know, reaching out to the Internet and social media. It's probably our best uh, shot at this point in YouTube is your program. One thing you discuss in the book, Jim, is the error of calling progressives liberals. Can you talk a little bit about progressives' control of language? I think language, following Orwell and others, very, very important. I'm not a huge fan, as you know from the book, of the word libertarian for a number of reasons. I think it has not served us well. I think we should take back the word liberal. Professor Gordon could explain this better than I could. But you know, back about 100 years ago, the, the word liberalism, which did stand for smaller government and things we, individual rights and the things we believe in, sort of got misappropriated by the socialists and the progressives. We've lost that word, unfortunately, but I, I really do think we should try to take it back. On the other hand, I think we need to have a word for the opposition, and progressive, I think, is out there. Many of them use that word themselves. I think it's really important. There's a lot of people don't like to label, you know, don't label me, and I always because it's like, you know, it's just, it's, you know, should should I label the furniture in my room? I mean, it's, you label things to identify what they are. And I think, I think labels are actually very important as long as they're accurate. It does mean liberty. It does mean freedom. So I think it's important to take that word back, the word liberal. I think it's a great word. It, it reconnects us with the glorious history of liberalism, classical liberalism, as we call it now. And I think that we need to label the opponent uh, progressive. Now, that, that that word itself is a somewhat dishonest word, but because they're not, in fact, creating progress. But given its historical roots in the progressive era and how Rothbard and Professor Waco and others have done a lot of excellent scholarly work exposing the true nature of the capital P progressive movement, I think it's about the best word we have. And I, and I think, think as, as time goes on, that more and more people using that term, and we just really need to explain to people what that term means and what it has meant in history, what it means in policy, and hopefully what it means in, you know, in, in psychology, which I guess is a lot of what my book is about. Well, I, I agree with you about labels, Jim. I think that's human nature. And labels go to narrative, right? It seems we all know, for example, progressive programs have been disastrous for the poor, right? 
Yes. And the so-called war on poverty has created dependency, not prosperity. But yet, progressives still maintain the narrative that they're the champions of the poor. They absolutely do. And one of the essential uh, elements of progressivism, since it's not really a rational system of thought, but a way for individuals and, and groups to convince themselves that they have gotten control over their lives or gotten control over the over what's going to happen in the future, that there's no internal definition or criteria for the failure of progressivism. I was just listening to a program this morning about how the you know the schools in New York are, are failing and uh, it, it, it never occurs to progressives that there's something intrinsically wrong with the government school system that it can't work and should be gotten rid of. Always the progressive will sometimes recognize that a progressive policy is not working out well, but the answer is always, and I point this out in the book, the answer is always more progressivism, uh, more spending, more power. In this case, they were trying to fight against tax credits for, you know, basically private and Catholic schools, but there's never a recognition. And, you know, you can look in the, in the city of Buffalo, Detroit, Baltimore, where I was last Friday, talking about these issues. And, you know, it, it, it's a wasteland. It's a, an economic wasteland. And so many of the young people, particularly uh, men and boys, are are in the county jail and the, uh, in the Attica State Prison. There's vacant houses, uh, vacant storefronts, and garbage-strewn lots. And yet, wow, you know, we've been in charge for 50 years, 60 years, 70, 100, depending on how you define it, certainly for a long time. And it's not working, and the fault is progressivism. I need to change my views. So I, I think I think the evidence that there's a psychological, powerful psychological dynamic behind progressivism is really strong. Well, let me give you another example. Progressives are good at painting some conservatives and certainly libertarians as radicals, right? Progressives, however, seem to get away with radical associations. For example, Hillary Clinton with Saul Alinsky and Margaret Sanger. Obama, of course, and Frank Marshall Davis. It almost seems like to flirt with or confess full communism, if you're a progressive, is seen as a youthful badge of honor. But yet here we are as libertarians uh, promoting what we would consider very sensible policies, uh, and we're tainted with the broad brush of radicalism. Again, if you look at it from a you know psychological point of view, what is the progressive's response to Really, anybody who disagrees with them, and I think increasingly, I think we're finding that they know who the true, their true opponent is. It's it's classical liberals, libertarians. Again, they don't want to argue with us because they really, they cannot. I mean, do they really have an argument for the minimum wage? No. It's sort of this wishful thinking, you know, this is going to give us a sense of control over the world. So what do they do? Instead of arguing, they, they smear they vilify, they attack, they, they challenge, uh, they, they question your, your motives, they question your character, but they never really uh, argue with us. So that, that type of smear uh, technique, uh, I think this flows out of the nature of, of progressivism. And again, I mean, if your listeners have, have ever had, you know, not a fight argument, but an argument, a rational kind of discussion with a progressive, it, it's it's almost impossible. It's almost impossible to, to have that. They often, you know, I've, I've had a number of them, and either they change the subject or they get angry and, you know, they raise their voice and they criticize you or they attack, uh, you know, attack you as a, you know, they attack your personality, whatever it had on them attack. So uh, I think that, you know, the, the, the concept that I'm putting forth in the book, I think pretty good well explains a lot of the ways that progressives think and act and the way they approach uh, uh, policy. Well, you talk about progressives impugning bad motives to libertarians. It seems to me that if you look at the history of the 20th century, the progressive century, which is, of course, full of body bags, uh, does it make sense for us as libertarians to assume that when we're arguing or talking with progressives that they're well-intentioned? Or is the evidence at this point so overwhelming that perhaps that's a, a naive way to do, to wage what is in effect a war? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I've heard that line over the years, don't challenge people's intentions, assume they have good intentions. And I always was puzzled by it because I, I, I guess one objection would be, what if they don't? I mean, why, why would you assume 
that they don't know. Okay, you know, it's hard to read people's minds. Well, you know, in the law, we read people's minds all the time. Somebody picks up a rifle and shoots an unarmed uh, person in the back. We assume that in their mind they wanted to murder them. So I do have a sympathetic view to progressives. I do believe we need to reach out to them. And I actually I have a flyer uh, that's mentioned in the book and it's on the website uh, designed to do that. But I don't, you know, necessarily want to assume that they, they all have uh, good intentions. I think ultimately, if you understand what progressivism is, um, it's, not, uh, it's not a good thing. Everything they do is, is a form of coercion or, or violence. It's really kind of a selfish philosophy. Now, maybe they don't realize that. If you're just coming out of high school or college, you think it's you have a different view of it, but when you really study it, and I, I tried to give some examples in the book of 12 or 13 sort of policy areas that show that their policies uh, not only didn't make logical sense in the first place, didn't have a rational argument for them, but actually worked out very badly in, in practice. You have to at some point say, this is, you don't have good intentions. I think your intentions are, are not good. Your intentions are to they stick to this failed ideology when evidence has been presented to you that it's failed. And, the, and, and of course, I talk about this in the book and, and base, basing my revisionist historians such as Rothbard. And it's just sort of the, the, uh, the dark side of progressivism, which is not so much, hey, we're going to solve all your problems, but we're going to have this ideology uh, of progressivism to sound good, but really we're just trying to get control the leaders of power so we can be wealthy, punish our enemies, we can be powerful. There's two sides to progressivism, and one is maybe a sincerely held belief at some level that government can improve life, but there's also always the special interests backing up behind that. We may not believe in the ideology, but they certainly want to get rich and, and, and be powerful and control the government for their own selfish uh, purposes. And by the way, just real quick, you see this in, in, in New York uh, with all the corruption scandals up here, two of the three uh, leading officials uh, have already been indicted, and, and, and you know, who knows if the governor is, is going to be. So, but, you know, behind all these all these progressive, and you read the indictment, you can read all the various progressive powers that have been granted to the government that were then manipulated by these politicians for personal, uh, you know, aggrandizement and wealth and, and, and power. So, you see this this dualism played out in New York uh, State currently in the headlines. Well, let's discuss activism, which you go into in the book. There's a great line in the book, strategy is the Achilles heel of the liberty movement. In your view, Jim, what does the movement do wrong? Basically, we need to be more concerned about how we are perceived and portrayed by the public. We need to sort of reconstruct the history of the last three or four hundred years and explain to people that, hey, you know, a lot of these good things that are part of the modern world that we like, we don't like everything, but we like a lot. A lot of these policies and programs and accomplishments were the result of people who, are, who get no credit for it, that's the, uh, the classical liberals and the uh, libertarians. But then also, yeah, politics is rigged. I've been in it since I was a child, so that's I'm 57. I've really been in it since I was about 10 because my father was a judge and he ran for office uh, five or six times. So I've studied in my various books, outlined why politics is a rigged game. So that being the case, you know, just like perhaps Pickett's Charge wasn't the best strategy at Gettysburg to go into a frontal, uh, a heavily fortified uh, position where your people are exposed. But I think that we, we have to emphasize direct citizen action more, and that's the title of one of my prior short books. Talk about it a lot in the, in the current book. In other words, since politics, which by which I mean elections and lobbying, are both rigged so that we will not succeed generally, let's, you know, instead of going forward, let's go sideways around that fortified position. Let's use direct citizen action. And the, and the clearest example, really, I think the most important one is uh, instead of lobbying the legislature for school choice, just yank your children up out of the government school and either homeschool them or find a private school. Now, not easy to do, but this is the type of thing that uh, you don't have to persuade anybody. You don't have to change anybody's mind. You just have to engage in your own direct action. And I think that if enough people did that, we would really start a uh, sort of a snowball effect. 
and there's other examples of, of direct citizen action. I, I think that juries, although we object to the fact that they're compulsory, I do believe that jury nullification is a form of direct citizen action, that the, the citizen is directly empowered to put a halt to things like the war on drugs. But if people fail to indict in the grand jury, if they fail to convict, but sure, one one verdict is not going to you know create a revolution. But I, I do believe in the butterfly effect. Uh, three or four, and some publicity, and now other people learning about it. And social change and social change can happen very rapidly. You saw that in uh, you know Iran under the Shah, Marcos in the Philippines, and more recently the, the so-called Belgian revolutions in uh, in Europe. Political change that you know people may think, well, boy, that's a slow strategy, yanking people out of. Uh, government schools, your, ch- your children. Not necessarily. They, political change can happen very, very quickly, but, you know, we need to start, if somebody has to light the fuse, I mean, that peacefully is a metaphor, uh, to get this ball rolling. And, and I, I know that uh, I'm not the only one working on it. I know uh, Ron Paul is putting together, his, Tom Woods is working on this as well, and others, uh, a, 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 a curriculum for people who do that very thing. So, basically, I think we need to shift if you want to be an activist, then you don't necessarily have to be. Uh, that's personal choice. But we need to shift away from electoral politics, not entirely, but mostly, and onto direct action. And that's really what I, uh, to try to get those ideas out and get people energized and show people examples of that. That's why uh, I started the website. And I, I was down in Baltimore the other day calling for an end of the uh, the drug war explained to people all these government agencies and how they can be empowered on juries. It's sort of an example of, of what I'm talking about. Instead of lobbying, you know, the legislature convincing the people themselves to, to uh, refuse to any longer be, be associated with this ridiculous drug war. Jim, do you think events like those in Baltimore recently opened people's eyes to the failures of progressivism? Or do you think it, it just strengthens their narrative, which is, hey, we need more help for these poor, more government help for these poor downtrodden folks in Baltimore? That's a good question. And it's going to take a while for people to, uh, you know, get to know us and to trust us and, to, you know, to think that they're not just being conned, you know, one more time. But I sat down with a local Baltimore uh, resident um, over a cup of coffee after the uh, press conference. He's, he's running for our councilman down there. I'm going to keep um, in contact with, with him. He's going to read the literature over. And uh, if we can, you know, uh, establish these, these small little, you know, openings, small little battlefronts, and again, I mean that peacefully uh, as a metaphor in uh, communities like Baltimore, that uh, people will, you know, will realize that we're, we're genuine and sincere. We're not, we don't want anything from them. We, we just want them to... Uh, uh, have a better life under uh, uh, under uh, liberty than, than what they have now. So I, I think I think there's hope. I think we need to we need to try. You know, I'm, I'm an optimist, and I'm a natural optimist. I think is, is brought forward to many people in the movement uh, um, are and work. Jim, as we wrap this up, I want to ask you a final question. You mentioned how understanding progressivism is really about understanding the psychology, and it's not necessarily a rational outlook or perspective. Can you elaborate a little bit more for us how you come upon this idea? Yeah. I just think that the world we, we live in, the, the individual often feels out of control. They're, they're not in control of their life. They're not in control of events. It's a big, scary world out there. And as various problems come up, a plane crash or some sort of an accidental death or a police shooting that was unjustified in a riot, whatever it is, the problem of, of the day, you have the progressives out there claiming, I guess kind of like the Marxists in the old days would claim to have a, a, a you know, hey, I got this great idea, let, let's try it out. We, we know that doesn't work, but the progressives are still out there saying, we can solve this problem for you. We'll pass a law, or we will increase the budget by a billion dollars, and that that is satisfying to that person. They now feel okay. Um, I I now feel like I have this problem under control. I feel better. That terrible feeling that I'm not in control of my own life situation, which none of us really like that feeling, has been um, ameliorated. Uh, they they feel better and. And that's, I think that's really after 45 years of studying this stuff from the time I was a teenager, 
watching the politicians and studying the progressives and people, just you know, regular people are progressives. I do believe that that's what this is. And, and it's, it's not a rational system of thought, which is why so often our sort of, you know, abstract logical approach does not work. Hey, Jim, I want to thank you for your time today. Great interview. Ladies and gentlemen, check out Jim's book on Amazon. It's called Progressivism, a primer on the idea of destroying America. And if you want to find him more directly, go to his site, libertymovement.org. Again, it's libertymovement.org. And have a great weekend.